Chapter 5, The Snargets. Well, children, tonight we have a guest reader playing the part of some boys. You have to guess who it is. Right, here we go. The Snargets. Why don't you go out and get some fresh air? Barney, dear, asked Grandmother. Barney stood and looked out of the window. Doesn't look very fresh to me, he grunted. A yellow fog hung over the trees outside. The smoke from the back kitchen chimney stirred itself into it, and there seemed to be a smell of distant cement works. Never mind, dear. It's better than stuffing indoors all day. Oh, all right, Granny, I'll go out. After about 20 minutes, he had found his jersey mixed up with his bedclothes. One outdoor shoe under the bed and the other one under the chest in the hall. He wandered out into the garden. It was neither warm nor cold and there was no wind at all. He made for the chalk pit, whistling with his hands in his pockets. As he came near the edge of the pit, he stopped whistling and stood still. There were voices coming from the bottom of the pit. His pit. Well, perhaps it wasn't his pit. It didn't even belong to Grandfather. Or did it? Perhaps holes in the ground don't belong to anybody. All the same, he was quite annoyed that other people should be poking around down the pit. He went cautiously to the edge and peeked over. Down there, among the tin cans and other rubbish, were three boys of about his own age or older, dressed in jerseys and trousers that were grubbier and more tattered than his own, and grey tennis shoes with holes in the toes. They all had long, rather greasy hair. Barney recognised them. They were the Snarget boys part of a large family that lived in an old house with tarred weatherboards and were always getting into trouble. At least, that was what the grown-up said. But then, who didn't get into trouble? The Snargets seemed to be building some sort of shack for themselves out of dead branches and old sheets of corrugated iron with a lot of horseplay and cries of... No, not that way, clever. Like this, see? Barney crawled to a place where a twisted tree trunk grew from the very edge of the cliff, hid himself behind it, broke off a handy-sized clod of clay and roots from the cliff edge and hurled it at the roof of the shack. It curved through the air towards the target but missed and landed almost noiselessly on a mossy log. Barney chose himself another clod and threw it. This time it struck the bottom of an upturned pail and exploded like a little bomb, scattering bits of clay over one of the snargets. Here, yeah. who's chucking dirt? cried the first snarget suspiciously. I never, said another snarget. Must have been him, he added, pointing to the third and youngest. Leave Leave off, will you? said the first. Oh. Leave off, will you? <laughs> said the first snarget. Oh, I. Rob, do you see? I never done nothing, protested the youngest Snarget. Oh, yeah, didn't you? Said the first. No, I never. Well, you don't do it again, that's all. At the top of the cliff, Barney, the cause of the trouble, chuckled to himself and broke off another clod. This time his aim was true, and the clod landed fair and square on the sheet of iron with a most satisfying clang. Three snarget heads popped out at once like ferrets out of rabbit holes. I told you, some were chucking dirt, said the first snarget. And I told you it wasn't me, said the youngest. They looked round scowling at the floor of the pit. All right. It's no use hiding. We can see you, called the elder Snarget. Barney hugged himself in silence behind his tree trunk. He knew this was just bluff. They hadn't even looked in his direction. It's old Albert, I bet, said the middle-sized Snarget. He's been on us. <laughs> we can see you, Albert, 
call the first snarget. Come out of that bush or we'll come and do ya. <laughs> they were standing looking at the far end of the pit with their backs to Barney. With great care, Barney broke off as big a clod as he could find and aimed it again at the roof of the shack. It hit and exploded with another loud clang, scattering pieces over all three snargets, who ducked wildly and clutched at each other and then looked foolish at being taken by surprise. They whispered fiercely among themselves, pointing at places on the cliff edge. Come from behind us, it did. No, up there he is. Don't be daft. He's up in them bushes. I tell you, I saw him. They all pointed in different directions at the edge of the cliff. It's all right, Albert, called the elder Snarget again. It's no use you hiding yourself up there. We're coming out to get you. But this didn't worry Barney either. By the time they got to the top, he could be well away. The Snargets must have thought this too because they didn't make a move. They retired inside their rickety shack instead. Barney scored another direct hit on it and a near miss. Heads popped out each time and looked round fiercely, but he was too well hidden and they failed to spot him. But there seemed to be a lot of whispering going on in the shack and then all three Snargets came out and started walking towards the way the towards the way out the elders called over his shoulder in a casual voice goodbye albert and the other two repeated it we're going home now albert called the eldest it's our dinner time but listen here albert we know you're up there just keep your hands off our shack see we've got something in there that's valuable we just dare you to meddle with it that's all the Snargers walked off towards the way out of the pit, whistling loudly and banging tins with sticks. Barney waited until he could hear their feet on the lane dying away. Funny, he thought. They've gone. Still, perhaps it's their di- it is their dinner time. He came out from behind his tree and went round the edge of the pit to the low side and walked along the bottom to the shack the Snargers had built. He wondered what the valuable thing was that they had left in it. There didn't seem to be anything except a paper bag full of chestnut conkers. Phew, silly old conkers, said Barney aloud. They're not valuable. Oh, perhaps they've buried something. He dug around in the mossy floor and unearthed a very rusty tin box. It had writing on this outside. He could just make out the letters gold block. It said. It felt heavy. Ought he to open it or not? He decided he would. There was no harm in just looking. The hinged lid was rusted to the bottom and wouldn't move. He banged at it with a stone. Out fell a rusty mass of screws, nuts, bolts and curtain rings. Inside the lid of the box was more writing which said that gold block was the finest pipe tobacco made from choice Virginia leaf. Barney threw the tin away in disgust and a voice said, All right, mister, come out. We got you covered. It was the Snargets that played a trick on him and crept back. He came out of the shack and faced the Snargets. One had a broken down old air gun and the others were pointing sticks. Oh, it ain't Albert, exclaimed the youngest Snarget. We can see that, said the oldest roughly. What's your name? He said to Barney in the same voice. Barney, said Barney, what's yours? I'm the Lone Ranger and he's Robin Hood and he's William Tell. Snapped the eldest Snarget. Golly, exclaimed Barney. Quiet. Snapped the first snarget. What were you doing in our shack? Yeah, and what do you mean by chucking dirt at us? Asked the second snarget. Yeah, and what you doing in our dump anyway? Piped the youngest fiercely. Can if I want to, replied Barney, pretending not to mind, but he was not really feeling very comfortable. He was not sure just how rough these snargets could get. Can if he wants to, he says exclaimed the Lone Ranger as if he couldn't believe his ears. What shall we do with him, fellas? Tie him to a tree and shoot him full of arrows, suggested Robin Hood. Put him in a dungeon and leave him to rot, said William Tell. No, I reckon we ought to lynch him on the spot, 
String him up, said the Lone Ranger masterfully. masterfully. We ain't got no rope, said Robin Hood. Well, we ain't got no outbows and arrows, pointed out William Tell. Well, there certainly ain't no dungeon for miles around, said the Lone Ranger. Let's give him a bit of slow torture. You wouldn't dare, said Barney, but he didn't feel too sure. Oh, wouldn't we? sneered the Lone Ranger. That's what you think. We often do, don't we, fellas? Do it all the time, don't we? Give people the slow torture. Yes, and shoot them full of arrows. Agreed Robin Hood. And put them in dungeons. Added William Tell. I'll tell a policeman, said Barney Stouters. The elder snogged looked carefully round the pit. Can't see no policeman here, he said scornfully. I'll tell my granny. She lives just up there, said Barney. The snoggers collapsed in howls of laughter. He tell his granny, he says. Hear that, fellas? He tell his granny. They cackled. Barney felt his face going red and tears coming into his eyes. Then he thought of something. I'm going to tell Stig, he said calmly. The laughter went on. He's trying to tell his Stig crack of the snoggers, but Barney just stood there and smiled and the laughter gradually died down. Who's Stig? The elder snogger asked suspiciously. Oh, a friend of mine, replied Barney early. Yeah, there ain't no such person, said the second deadly. Yes, there is, and he's my friend, said Barney. Where's he live? Squeaked the smaller snogger. Here, said Barney. Here? Chorus the snogger scornfully. What? what? In the dump? Yeah. jeered the elder snogger, and they all laughed as if he had made a joke. Yes, said Barney. Didn't you know? Go on, you can't half tell him, said the second. What's he do? Tell us that then. He makes bows and arrows out of television aerials and arrows out of bits of flint, replied Barney. The snoggers gaped at him with open mouths. Look here said the oldest at last. This here stick of yours, what is he then, a boy or a man? Barney had to think a little before he answered. Then, he's, he's a caveman. He said, he's a caveman, he said. At once the snoggers burst into jeers and laughter again. Yeah, stop the old caveman. He's got it out of a school book. He's pulling out of eggs. Making out he knows a caveman. Come on, fellas, let's do him. Slow torture, they cried. But Barney leapt off the pile of rubble he was standing on and set off at a run towards the other end of the pit. The snargets were after him with shrill cries. He's off! Get him, fellas! Yeah, chicken, run away, will ya? Barney jumped fallen tree trunks and burst through banks of nettles without caring for the stings. He knew them off the pit better than the snargets, and he seemed to be leaving them behind. Then he heard the voice of the eldest. Take it easy, fellas. He can't get out of this pit. Spread out so he don't double back. But Barney did not mean to double back. As quietly as he could so that his pursuers could not hear him through the nettle banks and elder trees, he made for the entrance to Stig's den, flung himself through the low doorway and collapsed, puffing, blowing, and pleased with himself on the floor of the cave. Stig was there, busy making himself a really horrible-looking club out of a tree root into which he was fixing bits of flint, broken glass and rusty nails. Oh, hello, hello, Stig, panted Barney. I'm jolly glad to see you. But when he saw the horrible club, he began to feel almost sorry for the snargets. He couldn't set his monster, he couldn't set this monster on three little boys who hadn't really done anything to him yet. It may have been only a game after all. You never could tell with the snargets. Barney just smiled uncertainly at Stig and Stig returned him a friendly grin. Then from outside came the sound of the snargets calling to each other. Has he gone back your way, Ted? No, I ain't seen him. Must be hiding round here somewhere. There were sounds of the undergrowth being beaten and stones being flung into bramble patches. Stig listened and looked at Barney suspiciously, but Barney made signs to be quiet. Oh, can't wait till I get my hands on you, Mr Barney. Wherever you are, came the voice of the elder Snargate. I'm all nettle stings one side of my face. We'll roll him in the nettles when we get him. That's what we'll do. He sounded as if he meant it, and Barney felt he was he felt he was not quite so sorry for the snargets. 
Footsteps crackled on dry twigs sounded quite close to the den. Barney moved further back into the cave and made signs to Stig to do the same, but Stig stayed near the entrance, bristling. Suddenly, the voice of the younger snog had piped up excitedly. Oh, there's a, there's an owl! There's an owl! An owl! Come on! Come out of it! And a large lump of chalk came flying in through the entrance and hit Stig smack on the side of the head. Stig gave one roar and charged out of his doorway. Barney threw himself after him so that what to see what would happen. The younger snogger gave one pop-eyed, disbelieving look at Stig and turned and fled, sobbing and screaming. Oh, it's, it's a cave! It's a cave! It's a cave, man! The other snoggers who had been closing in when they heard the youngest cry of discovery saw Stig and turned and ran too. Wait! Wait for me! Wait for me! Don't leave me! Wailed the youngest. Okay. And then uttered a shrill scream of terror as he put his foot through the bottom of a rusty enamel basin and fell headlong. Help! 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 He's got me! He's got me! Almost as alarmed as the young snarget, Barney ran up to where Stig was standing over the boy, who was shivering and moaning with fright and looked as if he expected to be eaten on the spot. But Stig was standing there looking down at the fallen William Tell snogged with an almost fatherly look in his eye. He bent down to help the boy to his feet and the snogged moaned feebly, Don't! Oh, don't! Then, seeing Barney approaching, he turned his eyes pitifully towards Barney and wailed, Oh, don't let him hurt me! Oh, don't let him hurt me! I wasn't doing no harm! But Stig kept hold of him and led him firmly but gently towards his den. The Snarget gang, troublemakers though they were, were not as black as they were painted. Anyway, they weren't the men to abandon one of their number to his fate, and perhaps too they had an idea that violence was not always the way to get things done. Stig, Barney and their captive had not been long inside the den before there came the sound of hesitant footsteps from nearby. Barney looked out and there were the two other snargets standing meekly together, unarmed and holding pocket handkerchiefs in their hands. The middle brother also had a handkerchief which might have been supposed to be white, tied to a stick. That means a sign of peace. A white handkerchief on a stick means peace. We got gifts! said the one with the white flag. Yes, said the other. We've come for the little one. Barney hesitated. You better come in, he said, but no tricks. Not likely, said the middle snogged. Not with that there pal of yawn. They came in through the doorway, saw Stig for the first time close to and stopped, their eyes growing rounder and rounder. Then the second of them took a step forward gingerly, holding out his hand with a paper bag in it. For you, he said in a shaky voice. It's jelly babies. Stig took the little bag in a puzzled manner, squeezing it, smelt it, turned it about in his hands. Barney realised that though he was clever at a lot of things, he was sometimes surprisingly ignorant about such things as paper bags. Then as he turned the bag in his hairy hands, one jelly baby fell out onto the floor. Stig's eyes widened and he stooped to pick it up and held it to the light of the lamp which was flaming in the back of the cave. With a pleased expression on his face, then he reverently stood on the, stood the little sweetmeat in a niche in the chalk and stood and looked at it. You're supposed to eat it, Stig, said Barney, getting rather tired of this pantomime. It's delicious. He went across to the jelly baby on the little uh, baby, baby, jelly baby's little niche and popped it into his own mouth. Stig looked horrified, and Barney was afraid for a moment he was going to hit him. There's more in the bag, Stig, he said hurriedly, and he took the bag from Stig and opened it and showed him the other little jelly figures. Go on, eat one, he urged. Stig took one between his finger and thumb, put it slowly in his mouth and chewed slowly. Barney and the Snoggers watched anxiously. Then a smile slowly began to spread over his face. The Snoggers, who had been standing there, strained and tense, sighed with relief and smiled too. Somehow everyone felt as though some very solemn ceremony had been performed. Barney handed round the bag and all five of them solemnly ate jelly babies. Then the middle Snoggers produced a second gift, 
which was little bags of fizzy sherbet with hollow sticks of licorice stuck in them to suck it through. They sat down to this. After a little instruction, Stig got the idea of how to suck the fizzy powder up through the little tube. But as soon as he got a mouthful and felt the unusual sensation on his tongue, he jumped up with an alarmed expression on his face and began coughing and spluttering. And the snargots weren't sure whether to laugh or be alarmed. But Barney banged Stig on the back, which impressed the snargots even more, and managed to soothe him down again. Finally, with a flourish, the elder snogger produced a packet of woodbine cigarettes and handed them round. All three snoggers took one, as if it was quite a usual thing, but this time it was Barney's turn to hesitate and wonder whether he should. As if he wished to show that they were all friends now, Stig took one, beaming, and without even looking to see what the others were doing with theirs, put it in his mouth. The smallest dog had suddenly explained, Eh, he's eating it! And before they could do anything, Stig had chewed up the little chip of tobacco and swallowed it with great satisfaction. The Snargets and Barney lit their cigarettes at the lamp. Barney immediately choked on his and threw it away and decided he didn't like smoking. The smaller Snarget puffed away and turned first white and then green. The other two smoked away quite happily, but Stig, though he ate another one, could not be persuaded to send up in smoke what he considered to be nourishing food. The Snargets began to feel at home. He's all right, your pal, Stig, said the elder Snargit to Barney. He don't say much, though, do he? Don't he speak English? <laughs> Smashing crazy he's got here and all, said the second. Cool, look at them old spears. I weren't really feared of him, piped up the youngest. I was just making out I was. Yeah, well, no, we wasn't really going to do no harm to old Barney here, was we, fellas? It was... All oh, just make believe, weren't it? Reckon old Barney and his pal Stig are all right, eh, hey, fellas? The others agreed in chorus. <clears throat> Barney felt a warm feeling inside now that the Snargots reckoned he and Stig were all right. I tell you what, went on the elder, went on the elder snake. Stig, Stig and Barney Stig. can be part of our gang from now on, and we all swear an oath, and we won't none of us tell no one about this here den. Barney was going to agree, and then he thought, well, it was his secret first anyway, so why should he swear about it with anybody? But the Snargets swore a horrible oath amongst themselves over the body of the last jelly baby in the bag, which they then cut the head off and buried to show what would happen to any of them who broke their oath. Barney felt fairly sure that his secret would not spread round the village now, and he felt somehow that Stig and the Snargets would get along very well together. Barney was quite surprised when he got back to Grandmother's house to find that he was in good time for lunch, and Granny was just dishing up dumplings. Did you find something to do outside, dear? asked his grandmother. Not a very nice day. Oh, I had super fun with the Snargus, Granny. First I bombed them, and then they were going to lynch me or torture me or something, but I got away to Stig's den, and the thought Stig was going to eat one of them, but we ate babies instead, you know, jelly ones. Oh, said Granny, aren't the Snargus rather rough boys for you to play with? Yes, but they're not nearly as rough as Stig. I reckon they're all right, said Barney. The end. I hope you liked our guest speaker tonight, kids. Sweet dreams.